Chang in San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, what goes up did indeed come down. Stocks boosted by day traders finally tumbling, wiping out a sizable chunk of the GameStop rally and more. I'll speak to Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian about the power of the people, but also the risks they face. Plus, lawmakers and regulators take notice. Republicans and Democrats calling for congressional hearings on the trading freeze put in place by Robinhood and other trading platforms. Robinhood now planning to reopen on a limited basis. Tomorrow, we will have the very latest. And the year ahead, I talked to the COO of SoftBank, Marcelo Clare, and Airbnb CEO, Brian Chesky. Their thoughts on where markets and the world are going, including, of course, the retail investor revolt. We're going to get to all of that in just a moment. But first, I want to look at the markets. U.S. equities mounting a comeback from their worst loss since October as moves to limit retail trading. Speculation in some companies open the door for hedge funds to load up on stocks that they had been ditching. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, who's been watching the market movers. And Ed, it's impossible to separate uh, what was going on with the uh, GameStop, et cetera, rally and everything else. But try to do that for us. Yeah, I mean, if the U.S. equity markets are to be believed, then the frenzy that we've seen driven by day traders, retail traders, is easing because U.S. equities were high, as you say, making a comeback from Wednesday when they had their biggest drop since October. The S&P 500 up around 1%, strength in financials, strength in industrials and materials, but less so in technology. I mean, tech was up on the day. The Nasdaq 100 up by 7 tenths of 1%. The NYSE Fang Plus Index also up by around half a percent, you know, taking to account here. And it's easy to forget that we are in the midst of a busy earnings season where expectations were incredibly elevated, particularly for the likes of Apple and Tesla, which I'll come into from in a minute. But in terms of outperformance, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index also up 2%. There is no escaping the story of the week, Emily. Chatter on the internet, chatter on sites like Reddit, driving incredible volatility in games. GameStop, uh, in stock, sorry, GameStop being the name to watch. It closed down on Thursday. Its first decline in five days. Extreme volatility. We've seen that. AMC also snapping six straight days of gains. But as I said, I, I do want to focus on big tech and earnings because you see Apple and Tesla, the biggest points decliners on the S&P, 500 on Thursday. Of course, the story of Apple record uh, revenue for the fourth quarter uh, for the fiscal quarter above $100 billion. But a cautious outlook for what's to come with the rest of the year. Slow growth, slowing growth in wearables and services and Tesla missing Wall Street estimates for the first time in ju since July 2019. But you see there Amazon a touch higher. Microsoft also up two point two more than two and a half percent. There is an element here that there could be some money going to momentum stocks, some money chasing profit stocks. You know, this idea going into earnings, of course, Emily, was that we would see outsized profit growth in big cap tech stocks relative to the rest of S&P 500. A lot going on, a lot of news headlines, <sighs> but U.S. equity markets higher on Thursday. Uh, I feel exactly the same way, Ed. Thanks so much for uh, trying to break it all down. I, I do want to uh, dig into what happened with GameStop and Robinhood specifically, which uh, now has taken a U-turn back after siding with what some say was Wall Street elite in the GameStop mania. The company now saying, quote, Starting tomorrow, we plan to allow limited buys of these securities. We'll continue to monitor the situation and may make adjust adjustments as needed. To be clear, this was a risk management decision and was not made on the direction of the market movers we route to. We stand in support of our customers and the freedom of retail investors to shape their own financial future. That, of course, after they stopped uh, trading on particular securities. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Romaine Bostic, who's been covering this no. all day for us. And Romaine, certainly this was not just institutional, uh, not just retail investors today. There was institutional money moving around. But it is astounding to see how um, you know, Robin Hood turning things off, yeah. essentially, and, and other brokerages, too, could have such a big impact. 
Yeah, I mean, we saw E-Trade, Interactive Brokers, pretty much all the major ones that at least specialize uh, in that retail trade basically flick the switch off. Robinhood going to flick the switch back on, at least partially, so some folks, I guess, could either get in or get out. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out tomorrow. But the interesting thing there uh, here, Emily, is that Robinhood kind of making it clear, at least in its own language, that this wasn't done at the behest of market makers. We had the CEO of Interactive Brokers on our program a few minutes ago, and he actually said he also was not under pressure but there's a lot of reporting out there that seems to be contradicting that, and it'll be something that we'll have to sort of parse over the next few days and weeks as to whether there was pressure either from the people that settle these trades and really carry a lot of the risk, or, and whether there was pressure from regulators on Robinhood and these apps to shut this thing down before it got out of hand. And I know you're going to talk with Alexis a little bit later here, but the backlash that we saw from the traders out there, and not just the traders, but we actually saw a lot of politicians come to the defense of some of these traders saying shutting them out at a time like this is just hypocritical. Traders were enraged, Romaine. Mm. Uh, that is clear. Robin Hood also now uh, getting hit with a couple of lawsuits. Is this the end or is this just the beginning oh, of something? <laughs> oh, it's the beginning. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, is going to go on for quite some time. I think you have uh, two sort of elements operating here. Of course, you have sort of uh, the madness of the crowds or the wisdom of the crowds that's sort of being fueled uh, by the uh, Reddit boards and the Discord servers. Uh, that's probably not going to go away. You have the regulatory aspects and the legal aspects that are going to arise as well. We've already had one lawsuit filed already today against Robinhood for shutting down uh, those accounts. Washington is involved. And then, of course, on top all that, you just have sort of the titans of this industry, the Wall Street titans out there who aren't shy about making it known that this is their casino and they're the only ones who get to gamble. Love the analogy. Romaine, thank you so much for breaking out down. We're going to be covering this, continuing to cover this throughout the show. Coming up, we are looking at how forums like Wall Street Bets on Reddit, on Discord, could change trading as we know it. We're going to ask the co-founder of Reddit himself and current 776 founder Alexis Ohanian, he's up next. And later, SoftBank's Marcelo Clore on the power of the individual trade. This is Bloomberg. What we've learned from this is there's a very strong group of people that before they were not being considered. And from now on are people that are making markets and we got to take them seriously and we're going to understand it. And there will be a driving force going forward. The power of the people, online forums on Reddit, Discord, and more, fueling massive market moves in GameStop, BlackBerry, AMC, and more, leaving hedge funds scrambling as they lose billions. With us now to talk about whether we're seeing a fundamental shift in power, market power from institutions to individuals, is 776 founder and Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian. Alexis, I know that you have been watching this. You've been at the edge of your seat. As the co-founder of Reddit, what is your take on what has been happening before our very eyes? Well, look, and let me say above uh, above all, right? I, I'm not. I can't speak for Reddit. I'm, I'm no longer on the board of the company. I'm, you know, as as someone who yes, co-founded it. Um, I've definitely been observing something that it, it reminds me of things we've seen over the last 15 years, um, where it, it's a similar story of a sort of a, a small moment that gets people's attention you know this this reddit user goes by roaring kitty um you know many months ago being excited about the gamestop stock doing a deep dive on youtube justifying why he's excited to buy it and it's snowballing and snowballing and snowballing and it's something now that has become very clearly a deeply personal phenomenon and, and i i kind of i would equate it to like you know folks voting with their dollars uh, in order to get back at or make a statement towards big finance. And, and what we've seen today um, is, is pretty shocking. Um, Robin, down, Robin Hood shutting down the ability to buy stocks. This, this feels like the very thing all of these people are railing against. So do you think uh, we're entering a new phase of internet activism? Like, could this start the next Occupy <clears throat> Wall Street? I, I think I think very much. I mean, just even seeing the sentiment, the comments, the very personal stories of people who have been crushed by uh, by 08 or who were crushed by 08 and, and felt like no one was looking out for them. 
I, I think this is this is very much the, the drum circle, so to speak, of Zuccotti Park having gotten now much bigger thanks to the connected internet and, and then much more effective, frankly, because you know every one of us now has access to buy and sell stocks. We have access to the same data everyone else does. We have, we have, have access to the same like computational processing power uh, that these funds do. And, and you know, people saw an opportunity where somehow hedge funds were able to, to you know, extend uh, shorts on, on more than 100% of the actual shares available for a company, uh, which seems deeply problematic. And they saw this and, and they used their, their dollar votes uh, to buy shares in a company. And, and, and it's become something much bigger. And I do think there's no genie going back in the bottle. Um, and, and if anything, the arguments for decentralization have just gotten a lot stronger uh, because this feels very disenfranchising for a lot of Americans right now to know that they can't buy shares. And, and it, again, it just reiterates, um, it, re it, re it reinforces this sentiment that the cards are stacked against uh, the average American when it comes to, to big finance. Uh, and and so, I'll say one of the things too, it, 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 you it's know, telling it, when you see- Go ahead. Uh, it, it's telling when you see AOC on on the same uh, in agreement with uh, like Tucker Carlson, right? You have you have both sides of the political spectrum agreeing on something that when that happens, it's rare, and it makes me lean in and want to learn more. You took the words right out of my mouth. AOC uh, tweeting today: "This is unacceptable. We now need to know more about Robinhood's decisions to block retail investors from purchasing stock while hedge funds are freely able." to trade the stock as they see fit. As a member of the Financial Services Committee, I'd support a hearing. Do you think cutting off Robinhood making this decision to cut off these trades, knowing that some people were probably investing some money that they don't have, um, was that the right call? I mean, it certainly certainly doesn't look like it. And, and let's be clear, they were, they were blocking the ability to buy, not the ability to sell. And, um, and yeah, this, this feels, and I, I think you're seeing very vocally from so many people on the internet, um, a, a very justified outrage. This feels like a very broken promise, especially from a company that promised to give power to the people, or I forget their tagline, but, but this seems to be the exact opposite of what Robin Hood aspires to be. That said, you know, there have been folks out there pleading with, uh, you know, some of these individuals, you know, don't, you don't want to be the one left holding the bag. And a lot of people mm -hmm. lost a lot of money today. Um, and I'm curious, do you have a, a message for the people? Chris Saka, uh, uh, longtime tech investor, said, don't trade mm -hmm. what you can't afford to lose. Uh, there's hopelessness and depression ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Chris, Chris shared some really personal stories, and and I, I I remember reading that and retweeting it. And I I think you've been hearing from a lot of folks, myself included, right? Don't invest what you can't afford to lose. And and I think it's worth noting that this is something I think for a lot of people that was a was a statement as much as it was an investment. I can't I can't speak for folks, but this this is this is a shift. And and I think for me, this is one more example of the strength of community. And I know it, it, something I've been talking about for a long time that, that continues to surprise me in ways that were totally unexpected like this. Um, but we're in a world where now the, the strength of community uh, of, a, of a, whether it's a bunch of K-pop fans or whether it's a community called Wall Street Bets, the strength of a community is, um, is very real. And, and I think you had folks who, uh, who, whether they were, you know, investing because of momentum, whether they were investing because of fundamentals, whether they're investing because it was a statement, I, I you know, it was every, it was all of the above. Um, I do, I do really feel like this, the the root of this is a financial system that has gone unchecked for a long time, uh, and of folks who have pushed for less and less regulation and less and less oversight and largely gotten it, and um, and when they've gotten it. In trouble, uh, the average American is one who, who bails them out, and and so I think what happens going forward, I'm I'm happy to see AOC talking about uh, investigation because I think the American public wants an answer and, and certainly deserves one as to why for a whole day and maybe even still to this I don't you know as as of this minute, but um they haven't been able to actually buy and sell on the purportedly free market. 
the risks that these forums can pose, though, in an age of misinformation and hype? Um, you know, how do we give, give people that power, but but combat, you know, you know, potential lies? <laughs> Emily, this is I think this is the this is the question for the decade, um, and we've seen it. We've had we have had versions of this discussion uh, around politics. We've had you know a lot of conversation around this. I think something Chamath brought up on CNBC that was really telling was you know to the credit of these communities, they are publishing their work publicly. They're not doing this behind you know small uh, cigar filled rooms where actually typically this kind of of stuff is done. And, um, and I do think we're in an era now where we have ubiquity of, of this technology. Um, we have the financial technical infrastructure, the fintech infrastructure, whether it's decentralized or not. I, I think this brings about a wave of new companies that are actually working to harness the sort of collective intelligence of lots of people. Um, the, the sort of right. what is the decentralized version of this fund sort of look like of these investing strategies and tactics look like. Um, but but one thing's for sure, you know, the, uh, everyone who's participated in this in one way or another isn't just going to forget. And, and, and there is, I think, a Rubicon that's been crossed. And so now we need to figure out how this sort of how the financial markets are going to react to a world or, or sort of be adapted to a world where retail has, you know, real weight. And, um, and, and that you know, right. the consumer actually has the ability to do what the banks have done for a long time. We got just about 30 seconds left, Alexis, and I want to mm -hmm. uh, I want to hear what you're doing now, what you're doing at 776, you know, where you think the world is going when it comes to the intersection of community and capital and where you're placing your bets in a nutshell. That's I mean, that the community, that intersection of community and capital is something that I really didn't even fully process until over the past year. And it's become so apparent to me. And as more and more tools get into the hands of more and more people to put their hard-earned dollars in a world with, uh, you know, zero to negative interest rates, uh, and in a world where people are looking for more opportunity, I think everything from like the value of cryptocurrencies to trading cards are going to continue to appreciate as there's more and more interest for individuals to be able to take control and get access and get yield for themselves, and that it shouldn't just be the realm right. of the ultra-rich anymore. Alexis Ohanian, founder at 776, co-founder of Reddit. Really appreciate you bringing your perspective here today. Thank you so much for stopping by. Coming up, some say Miami is the next Silicon Valley and SoftBank wants in on the action. We're going to speak to Marcelo Clare of SoftBank. Coming up, this is Bloomberg. Amid fears of a Silicon Valley exodus, SoftBank Group is committing $100 million in funding for companies in the Miami area, bolstering a beachside metropolis that's been aggressively courting the tech industry in recent months. I caught up earlier with COO Marcelo Clare in an exclusive interview at Bloomberg's The Year Ahead, a virtual event. Most people that are in the tech world have been following the amazing work that Mayor Suarez is doing of showcasing Miami to the tech world and uh, knowing that Miami is so close to us, so close to SoftBank and so close to myself, we couldn't not be part of it. And we are huge believers that in order to propel a tech hub, you need two things. You need talent. And the amazing thing of this pandemic is that people are free to live wherever they like. And once people have a chance to come and visit Miami once, especially from certain places in the West Coast, then suddenly people love Miami and they want to stay. So there's talent. But usually the second piece is capital. And uh, what we decided to do today is to make, a, we call it the 100 million SoftBank initiative. And that is basically, we all got together within SoftBank and we made a commitment to $100 million to startup companies that are either in Miami or that are moving to Miami. So when you combine talent with capital and with so many people moving to Miami these days, we wanted to make sure that we contribute to to Mayor Suarez, who is truly welcoming to see a government official actually embracing tech. So is this new money or is this money coming from some of SoftBank's other funds, like the Latin America Fund? I mean, we will make a decision as the investment come, and we just put a number of 100 million. I mean, it could be much larger 
due to the fact that we have the Vision Fund, we have the Latin American Fund, we have the Opportunity Fund, and we have SoftBank's balance sheet. But the message that we wanted to send is this is money that's 100% allocated to startups, and we're doing investment that traditionally maybe we wouldn't do. We can't avoid the biggest story of the moment, which is what's happening with GameStop, um, you know, what's happened with Robinhood today with respect to that. And I'm curious, do you see what's happening now as a fundamental shift in where power lies, whether it's in institutions or with the people, or is this just a moment of temporary insanity? It's not. It's not. It's not it may, you might call it a moment of temporal insanity, but you cannot run away from reality that because of the pandemic, we have created now millions and millions of people because of the low cost of entering to a stock and the low cost of exiting to stock. Now you have a diversified force of items. It was 14, 15 million people who are basically trading stock. So you cannot ignore them. I mean, they are a, one of the driving forces as it relates to you know, acquiring company stocks or future IPOs or future ways in which companies will go public. I mean, you cannot, you know, you cannot ignore that. It's a new, it's definitely a new way of investing. However, yes, the madness, you know, the madness that we've lived through the game stock, stock or through AMC and all that, I think we need to look at that and we need to learn, you know, how to make sure that that doesn't happen again, because I don't think the stock market was set up to do this sort of speculation. So I think, what, what, what we've learned from this is there's a very strong group of people that before they were not being considered, and from now on are people that are making markets, and we got to take them seriously, and we're going to understand it, and there will be a driving force going forward. Absolutely. I mean, does it have you worried about bubble? I mean, I feel like, you know, I've been covering tech for 10 years, and we've been asking that question for 10 years, um, and markets keep going up. Um, at, at some point, is there a correction? I mean, there will be corrections for certain companies, but you cannot underestimate how new companies, mainly tech companies, are basically growing at an accelerated space that otherwise they wouldn't because of the pandemic and because of the, digit of the digital world that we're living today. So the market is not used to, but I mean, you have all, I call them these new tech companies that are massively disrupting and transforming traditional business models. So you're going to see those companies grow fast in value because they're disrupting, you know, traditional business models. My conversation with there with SoftBank Group COO Marcelo Clari at the Year Ahead event. You can catch uh, the full conversation online. Coming up, Tesla's earnings results missed Wall Street forecast for the first time since July 2019, driving shares down there as well. We're going to break down the numbers next. And also Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky gives us his, his outlook on travel demand. More from Bloomberg's year ahead event next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I want to get back to Robin Hood and GameStop and U.S. lawmakers in the Senate and the House holding separate hearings on the short selling and GameStop trading frenzy, as well as the, quote, current state of the stock market. This, as Bloomberg has learned, trading service Robin Hood has drawn down some of its credit lines with banks tapping at least a, several hundred million dollars. Joining us now for more, Bloomberg's White House reporter Jordan Fabian, of course, Robinhood uh, stopping trading uh, of certain securities, then uh, uh, reopening them, they say, starting tomorrow. Jordan, what is the latest in terms of actions that lawmakers say that they intend to take? Like you laid out at the beginning, this has really captured the attention of Congress. You know, unity is this buzzword in Washington, and we haven't seen much of it in the first week of Joe Biden's presidency, but this is bringing members of both parties together, Republicans and Democrats, saying they want to take a look at this. So you're having uh, the Democratic-controlled uh, Senate Banking Committee is going to hold a hearing on this. And you have Republicans um, also saying that they want to go along with that and have hearings in, in the House and the Senate as well. So we're expecting some scrutiny of this as soon as lawmakers come back to town, maybe as soon as next week. And in addition, the Biden administration says that the SEC is still uh, looking at what, what has happened this week, uh, no action or anything like that announced quite yet, but they say they do, they are keeping an eye on it. 
So uh, who's going to be investigating who and, and what are they going to be investigating? I mean, there's so many different players here. And, you know, we've been speaking to SEC experts uh, for the last 24 hours. They can't confirm that anything illegal has actually happened. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's, not, it's not clear there's been any illegal activity. But what lawmakers were focused on today was uh, Robinhood and other trading platforms' decision uh, to prevent retail investors from purchasing sh shares of GameStop and other stocks. You know, they said this was an example of hypocrisy because you know, hedge funds have been able to short stocks like this for, for a long time. And, and now these, these platforms are putting limits on, on folks who are trying to make the opposite play. And they say this is an example of, you know, inequality about how you know, Wall Street is run amok. And they want to take a look at this, whether there have been, uh, you know, legal, legal actions or not, uh, market manipulation or anything like that. Um, it's something they want to take a closer look at. So, uh, you know, given the team that uh, President Biden now has in place, um, especially in, in, in regulatory seats, what kind of action uh, do you think will be taken here and how aggressive do you think that action will be? Well, this is one thing that's complicating the Biden administration's approach to this is their, their pick to lead the SEC, Gary Gensler, uh, has not been confirmed. And in fact, we don't even really know what the Senate schedule is to confirming him and putting him in position. So uh, anything that's going to be done is going to be done by the acting head of the SEC. And, and, you know, Gary Gensler is somebody who's had a reputation of being tough on Wall Street. So you would expect that they that, that might be a direction they, they would go in to give real scrutiny to everything that's gone on here. But, but he's not in place at the moment. So uh, that's also a wild card here as the Biden administration looks into this. And how much of a priority do you think something like this is going to be when there are plenty of other top priorities? Yeah, frankly, I, I don't think that this, although it's captured the attention of, of many, many people, uh, is, is on the top of the, the radar for the Biden White House. You know, they are focusing right now on getting their virus relief bill passed through Congress, which has been uh, some tough sledding. And they're also focusing on rolling out their policy agenda by executive order, which they've been doing each day uh, over the course of the week that the president has been in office. And, and, and you know, this is not a White House that tends to uh, sort of fl go with the flow of, of headlines, things that are dominating in the media, maybe like the Trump White House did. And, and so while the White House says they're keeping an eye on this, I wouldn't expect this to dominate their discussions uh, over there at 1600 Pennsylvania. All right, Jordan Fabian uh, with an update from Washington. Thanks so much, Jordan. Of course, we're going to continue to follow uh, what happens. Meantime, in other news, Tesla's earnings out Wednesday still uh, capturing investors' attention. The company reporting a lower than expected profit and record revenue, mixed results thus that disappointed investors who are used to more razzle-dazzle from Elon Musk's company. Uh, despite giving a six straight Profitable quarter, uh, Tesla missing estimates for the first time since July 2019. Tasha Keeney with us, analyst at ARK Invest. Tasha, what's your read on this? Yeah, well, you know, I'd say in general, um, at ARK, as, as we've talked about before, we're long-term investors. And I, I think that's sort of the, the lens that you should put on innovation is look to the long term. Um, so a company like Tesla, you know, the quarter to quarter results, uh, we're not we're not exactly tracking to them. Um, you know, I think there are two uh, really important takeaways from the call that I took. Um, the first is if you look at electric vehicles broadly, um, which, I, which I think are the, you know, the undeniable future of the auto industry, um, the Model S is the, you know, it came out, the new Model S is going to have um, unbeatable range, uh, zero to 60 acceleration in, in less than two seconds. Um, I mean, most automakers are trying to catch up to the original Model S, and, and now you see this new variant. It, it really just highlights that Tesla's the leader here, and it's just going to become harder for other automakers to compete on price and performance. The second thing I'd note is for autonomous technology, um, when you look at Tesla's valuation, which is, you know, um, often and sort of uh, there's a lot of speculation about uh, whether or not this makes sense. I, I think that, you know, as, as Elon said in the call last night, a lot of analysts aren't considering this opportunity in autonomous driving. At Argonvest, Invest, we've done a lot of work on that. So we actually just put out our big ideas report and we talk about the, the future of uh, 
autonomous vehicles, I think the operating earnings to the platform providers like Tesla uh, could be worth over a trillion dollars globally by 2030. So this is a massive opportunity. Um, you know, Tesla's really uh, a, a key player here as they have um, probably the biggest data advantage out of, out of anyone um, competing. And, and I think that's important perspective to keep. Tasha, we also saw Apple shares uh, under pressure despite a, a strong quarter there. And I'm curious, do you think some of the, the you know, market dynamics we were seeing more broadly with, with what was happening with GameStop and the uh, brokerages pausing certain transactions, do you think that impacted Tesla shares today? Uh, you know, I, 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 as, as we, you've talked about it, I think a, a lot of uh, sort of crazy things are going on right now. Um, I, I'd say longer term, you know, uh, we think that fundamentals are, are going are gonna to win out. So, um, again, if, if that were to be the case, I, I would say that's, that's you know, a, a sort of a short term phenomenon. And, um, you know, with disruptive innovation, it grows at um, an exponential rate. Uh, so you really have to have that sort of five year uh, time horizon as, as we do at ARK Invest. I want to talk a little bit about China. You've got competition not far away in China and the United States, and, and the price cuts in China are driving margins lower. Um, how concerned are you about that? Well, when we think of margins and, and price cuts, I, I mean, the work that we've done on electric vehicles, so, so the reason that we think um, EVs are so competitive is because battery costs are declining. Um, we use something called the Wright's Law to forecast the, the cost decline of batteries. And uh, for every cumulative doubling in production, you get a corresponding reduction in, in price. Uh, so that's the cost curve that, that Tesla's following. So that should allow for uh, better gross margins, or again, you could offer lower price cars. I mean, the $25,000 car that they plan on producing over the next uh, three years, I think I think is the, the biggest you know, case of that, of, of sort of this, this crossover point with um, electric vehicle prices versus gas powered cars that's really enabled by that cost decline. Um, you know, I, I think there there is competition in the EV space, and there should be, um, because you know we think that EVs could grow to uh, 40 million uh, units annually um, in, in the next five years. So I think that that figure, um, you know, with my co my colleague Sam Corris has done a lot of work on, really depends on uh, traditional automakers and these competitors making electric vehicles too. Tesla's not going to be the only player. Um, we do see them dominating uh, the market now. You know, they have the, the the best market share. They have over 20 percent of the electric vehicle market. You know, they're the number one brand in, in, in China as well. And and that's something that's really been hard for any foreign automaker, um, you know, to to sort of wholly own their factory. Tesla's the first to do that there. So, so I think they've had, had great success, um, and, and competition's not a surprise. What do you think the most promising competitors are? Who are you watching? So when you look at electric vehicles in China, um, one, one company that uh, we think is interesting is, is BYD. So um, in China, Tesla is looking to uh, a different type of battery in their vehicles, lithium ion phosphate. Um, BYD has, has, been, has been building on uh, you know, that form factor for, uh, for, for some time. Um, and, and there's another, uh, I'd say, leader in, in electric vehicles. Um, we've looked at some of the, the startups, um, the newer players in the space. I, I think they're interesting. We are certainly keeping an eye on them. Right now, their valuations just don't make sense for us. Um, and, and a lot of these companies, uh, you know, we've seen with Tesla that scaling um, is not a feat to be overlooked, right? The, the, the manufacturing expertise that you need to, to get to scale is really crucial here. So I, I think that's something to look out for um, with, with these newer players. Um, you know, I think things in China can happen very quickly. Uh, so, you know, we're, 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 we're aware of that. Um, but, but so far, you know, they, they do still seem to have the best technology on the market, you know, from a battery, but also a software perspective, um, you know, with, with autonomous driving and autopilot. Um, we haven't seen anyone meet that mark yet. Um, but again, we do expect other players to, to come in. So, look, I know you're bullish on Tesla, but what do you think the biggest headwinds are? What do you, what do you think are the biggest challenges ahead? Well, I think, um, you know, one critical step for Tesla is solving for fully autonomous driving. So last night on the call, Elon said that he thinks that Tesla could do that within the year. Um, you know, I, I think that, again, Tesla has this data advantage. They're collecting information from their customer cars. 
Um, no one else has a fleet that is the size of Tesla's when it comes to autonomous driving because every other player is using uh, fleets of prototypes that you know usually uh, number at most in the hundreds. So uh, they do have this uh, uh, amazing lead that could allow them to to launch on say like a national level as opposed to city by city where where Waymo um, will likely have to go that route. Um, but they still have to prove that they they can do it right. And 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 we haven't seen that yet. Um, so you know, in, in the valuation model that we we published, we actually only assigned a thirty percent probability to that actually happening. Um, that said, one, one of, some of the newer research I've done is is looking at Tesla's opportunity in ride hailing. So Tesla says they're going to go all in on robo taxi, and that's and that's you know eye on the prize. Um, I think they could launch a ride hailing network ahead of full autonomy with human drivers behind the wheel, and they'd still get that nice recurring revenue stream, those high margins that we expect off of those autonomous taxi platforms. And they'd have a lot of competitive advantages against Uber and Lyft because they're lower, uh, it's a lower cost per mile to drive a Tesla. They have vertically integrated insurance. Um, we think they could do it better than the other players out there and potentially take a higher cut of the gross revenues off of the system because of those cost advantages. Um, and even perhaps pay their drivers more. Um, so I think you know autonomous is it's not certain, but um, there is that percent, potential sort of uh, downside protection if they, if they were to uh, to launch a ride hailing service. All right, Tasha Keedy of Ark Invest, always great to have your thoughts here on the show. Thank you so much for joining us and weighing in. Coming up, Americans are planning to travel this year, just not for business and not very far from home. Airbnb co-founder and CEO Brian Chesky shares his prediction for the year ahead with us next. And of course, his thoughts about companies like GameStop getting a groundswell of retail investor support and changing the conversation. This is Bloomberg. I do think that, you know, one of the benefits of having a great brand is a lot of people want to be a part of it and they want to own a piece of it. And that just means that, you know, you're, you're, your, your, your responsibilities increased. You know, I think that the responsibility of a CEO in America today is different than it was maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Even as countries begin to roll out vaccines against COVID-19, Airbnb predicts that travel in 2021 will be focused on regional destinations rather than international tourist meccas, what co-founder and CEO Brian Chesky calls meaningful travel. I caught up with him at Bloomberg's Year Ahead event earlier today. Most people have been in their homes and they haven't really been able to leave their homes very much for nearly a year. And this travel season, people will mostly have been sheltering in place for more than a year working from home. And we did, a, we did a survey, a representative survey of American travelers, and they told us a few things. The first thing they told us is they miss traveling. In fact, Americans miss traveling more than any other outdoor activity. Second, Americans are telling us they actually are planning to travel this year. 54% of Americans surveyed said they either already are planning their trip or plan to travel this, this summer. But something's gonna be different about how they travel this summer. You see, the thing people don't miss is business travel. They say the travel they miss the least is traveling for business. Uh, they don't miss landmarks. They don't miss crowded lobbies. They don't miss getting on double-decker buses. What they miss is, you know, the thing they feel like was taken away from them, connection to their family and their friends. So the kind of travel they want is meaningful travel, not mass travel. They want to have meaningful time with their friends and family. And so they want to get in cars in America and travel within a tank of gas about 200 miles typically staying at small communities with their friends and family. I think that's what travel is going to look like this year, a shift from mass travel to meaningful travel. And I do think it's going to be uh, really eventful, um, certainly summer for travel. Okay, so summer is your time frame when you think things start to open up. And when that happens, does it look like the roaring 20s? I mean, you know, mm. uh, give us the picture. Well, it's a little hard to say. Anyone who was in the business of predicting, I said in my letter, anyone in this business of predicting the future was humbled last year. So if I'm going to try to stay within the constraints, what we think will happen. I think it's going to be gradual. And, you know, it's hard to say what month it's going to happen. I use summer for a proxy for the moment. People feel safe leaving their homes. I think vaccinations are going to be critical. Um, one of the top, re top, top, two of the top reasons people want to get vaccinated is they want to see their friends and family and be safe, and they want to travel and be safe. 
But one of the things they want to do is they want to travel to places where they're either private, not around a lot of people, or in cities and communities where most people have been vaccinated. So I think it's a little hard to predict. I think it's going to be really moving in line with the health crisis. But yes, the Roaring Twenties did come after the Spanish flu. And so I think people are yearning to get outside and to be together. I think you can't keep people apart for too long. And I think that's something that we're going to learn again. So we should be booking our summer vacations now to avoid the crush, is what you're saying. Well, who knows? I, 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 um, I, I uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to... I, I'll try to not predict too much. The good news is I don't think too many people, I don't think everyone's going to be going to the same city on the same date. I think because people are more flexible and they're working from home, you know, they can kind of take, you know, you know, I don't think you're going to have this flood of everyone going on the same week to Las Vegas or Miami or L.A. They're going to probably, because not as many people will be flying right away, be distributing to more communities. So I think we're going to see is more people going to more places over more dates. That's going to spread out travel, which will probably reduce crowds. That's what I think will probably happen. Now, these are just predictions, of course. Now, Brian, my interview with you on IPO Day went kind of viral. Uh, I told you live on the air that the opening price had doubled, and we all saw your eyebrows go up really high. What was going through your head in that moment? Um. Well, first of all, I did not know my eyebrows went that high either. Um, <laughs> but um, what was going through my head was just, I don't know, at that moment, I think it was kind of a flashback of the last year. Um, because I, I remember we started 2019, 2019, or sorry, 2020, like a lot of people did, thinking their life would be one thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, our stock just goes down significantly. Um, probably in the depth of the crisis, our stock was, you know, just a little over $20 a share. And, you know, we, we, had, we, had, we had got all hands on deck and we said, you know, we're not really going to worry about things we can't control. We're going to focus on trying to truly build a great company. And I think at that moment, I think the year crystallized for me. The year crystallized everything we did and everyone that believed in us. And it all probably, I think, really hit me at that moment. So Airbnb last year it, in one of those private funding rounds was valued at $18 billion. Now it's $113 billion-dollar company. Um, in your view, is Airbnb really worth that? You're the guy who has to deliver and make it so. Well, I, again, I don't want to comment on a stock price. I think it's going to get a dangerous pattern for me to start doing that. But I will say that we are building a company for the very long term. I know that probably sounds like a cliche, but I'm 39 years old. So I, I do intend to be doing this for, for decades to come. And, you know, I don't want to get in a comment of, uh, of um, comment on stock price, but I will say that the higher the price, the higher the expectations and the higher expectations, the more responsibility we feel. So I think we already felt a lot of responsibility before, but I now feel a lot of responsibility for all the new stakeholders, all the new shareholders we have. And, you know, that just motivates us even more. My conversation there with Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky at our Year Ahead event. You can catch the full conversation online. Coming up, Apple shares fell today after the company's cautious outlook overshadowed better than expected first quarter results. We're going to get the wrap next. This is Bloomberg. Apple reported first quarter results Wednesday as iPhone revenue hit $65.6 billion. But it was a cautious outlook that overshadowed the record haul. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman reports. I'm Mark Gurman with Bloomberg Technology. And on this week's episode of Power Up, I'll be recapping Apple's record Q1 2021 financial results. The company hit an all-time revenue record, growing 21% to $111.4 billion. That was mostly made up of iPhone sales, which reached $65.6 .6 billion during the quarter. Services, the Mac, iPad, and wearables all grew as well, as did revenue across all of Apple's major regions. Expectations were sky high for Apple's overall and iPhone revenues during the quarter, and the company certainly met those expectations. But not all investors were completely pleased with the results. While the company did not give guidance for the current quarter yet again, Apple's CFO did give some color as to what to expect when it announces its results in March. 
he said that the company is expecting a deceleration for both the wearables and AirPods category and services. That's a nice way of saying that the wearables and services segments are likely to see an annual growth decline next quarter. The Mac, for all of its improvement, also slightly missed Wall Street expectations. On the earnings call, Apple said that its overall user base topped 1.65 billion devices, with the iPhone now accounting for over a billion of those devices. Tim Cook, Apple's CEO, also discussed Apple's opportunities in India and other developing regions, and he implied that the pricier iPhone 12 Pro and iPhone 12 Pro Max models with better cameras are seeing the bulk of iPhone 12 purchases. Apple also said that the App Store, iCloud subscriptions, and Apple Music all performed well, but notably absent from much discussion was Apple TV+, Plus, the company's streaming video service. Netflix, HBO Max, Hulu, and other streaming services have all been booming during the pandemic, but apparently not Apple TV+. Plus. Still, the quarter was Apple's strongest to date, and the company seems to be expecting many more of those to come. I'm Mark Gurman. This is Power Up. Our very own Mark Gurman. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Daybreak Asia is coming up next. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.